Welcome to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Molter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today. Sit tight, get your Bible, and get ready to get in the Word with us as we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book through the Word of God. Well, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Numbers chapter 11. Title of our study is, So You Want to Go Back to Egypt. I picked that title because it comes from a song, and some of you might know this. Uh, Musician Keith Green, uh, many years ago, wrote a song called, So You Want to Go Back to Egypt. And um, you'll have to check it out online. That will be your homework assignment. Google it later or uh, however you search for music. Uh, it's very comical, very funny, um, and talking about uh, how the Israelites wanted to go back to Egypt and how they thought it was so much better. Um, and so we'll take a look at that, actually. It'll be uh, kind of the, the gist of this chapter. Um, but what we'll, what we'll see is that the people complain to God about manna. And, um, and it becomes the, oh, it's just manna again. The same old manna over and over again. So they kind of get bored of God's uh, miracle of this manna or wonder bread, if you will. And, uh, and then because of that, uh, they will face the consequences uh, and a little bit of the anger of God. And so as I was thinking about that, you know, complaining comes so naturally to us, doesn't it? Um, I'm convinced that's probably the bulk of social media today. It's just people complaining. And I've heard that before, that uh, when people are upset about something, they'll get on social media and complain about that business. And uh, they're 10 times more likely to do that than to actually praise them for doing something right. And I thought, wow, that's, that's kind of sad reflection of our society is that if you go somewhere and they do a great job, you know, you don't leave a nice review. Um, and I thought, we should be, we should be doing that. Um, but more likely than not, people will complain. And so, um, so there's much that we can learn from this chapter, including myself. And so, um, so with that, uh, let's take a look at the first 15 verses. And we'll see that the people complain. And uh, we'll see what they're complaining about, essentially, and who they're complaining about. And so with that, uh, Numbers chapter 11 Picking up here in verse 1. Now, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. So he called the name of the place. Tabera, because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. Now, the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? Verse 5. We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt. All the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Now the manna was like a coriander seed, and its color like the color of bedellum. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it on millstones or beat it in the mortar, cooked it in pans and made cakes of it. And its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. And when the dew fell on the camp... In the night, the manna fell on it. Verse 10. Then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Moses also was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you afflicted your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? That I beget them, that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a, a nursing child, 
to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they weep all over me, saying, Give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now if I have found favor in your sight. And do not let me see my wretchedness. We'll pause there. We see that as the people complain, it begins to have this infectious property. And then we find even Moses begins to complain. (laughs) And so we see that there's a ripple effect that if we start complaining that it can actually begin to rub off on others. And well, I can find something to complain about too. Well, I have something to complain about. And it kind of spreads through the whole camp. And if you've read the book of Numbers, if you haven't, I'll just tell you this. There is a pattern of chronic complaining. Um, In fact, the whole next chapter is about complaining as well, uh, complaining against leadership. Um, And essentially, all this complaining about the provision of the Lord is really complaining about the Lord. And again, God's control of the circumstances of our lives. So if we're complaining against the provision he's given unto us, we're really complaining against what he's what he's doing in our lives. We're complaining against him. Um, And so we have to be careful about that. And that's not to say that as bad things happen to us, we're never to complain about those. No. But this means that if I'm a child of God, I'm called according to his purposes, I must be content with what he's given me. Not covetous that, hey, over in that land, they've got all this stuff and I want that. Be content with what God's given to us. And then we also need to believe that all things are working together for good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. And he tells us that in Romans 8, 28, right? So we need to to hold on to that verse as well to know that, you know what, God, I don't understand what's going on in the economy, understand what's going on in the world, but you know what, I'm going to be content with what you've given me. I'm going to be thankful and grateful for what I do have and not complain about what I don't have. Now, if you're a parent or uh, a grandparent, You've, or you've been around kids, um, you know that there are times where they're hungry or tired or bored or, um, or sometimes they just want to do something else that they will complain. And some of you have been on long road trips recently and, um, and we'll be on, a, on one here in the next few weeks and you probably know what I'm going to say is that oftentimes kids in the car, what's the question they ask? Are we there yet? You've heard it, Okay. And maybe the first time it's not a bad question, but by like the 200th time, that repetitiveness, it's not really a question anymore, is it? It's complaining that you're not there yet. And that's in in essence what's going on here is the children of Israel having that, oh, manna again. Instead of realizing the provision of God, this miracle, they didn't have to go out and, 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 and harvest and plant. And so God provided food supernaturally for them. They just had to go and gather it and then they could use that. And God even provided it, we know, a double portion the day before the Sabbath so that the Sabbath day they could just rest and enjoy fellowship as a family uh, in the presence of God. And so we see that uh, they begin to complain that they're uh, complaining against the provision of the Lord. Now again, I'm not saying that all complaining is bad. I would say if you buy food and they gave it to you wrong, I think you've got every right to complain and say, hey, I paid for this, please make it right. But you don't need to complain in a way where you're nagging at them. You're just uh, kind of frustrated and you're asking in a polite way from them to to give you the food the correct way or or what you really ordered. But if you complain that you don't like it, that it doesn't taste the way that you like it, well, too bad. You ordered it. You paid for it. That's on you. Order something else next time. But we want to make sure, again, we're, we're guarding our hearts because I can, I just find, I don't, I'll speak for myself, complaining comes so naturally. Um, it, maybe it's a gift that we have in the flesh, but it just seems so natural that we can find anything to complain about. Um, and maybe that's just because here in the Midwest, we can talk about the weather and find something to complain about with the weather. But um, as children of Israel, they would murmur and complain about God's provision. Again, they would say the manna was getting old and then God would become angry. We see several occasions we find Moses interceding for the people. Uh, We'll see instances where he's falling on his face, asking God to have mercy to not wipe all the people out. 
and pleading before the Lord, please don't destroy them. And then we see God's abundant grace is poured out. He forgives. He, he forgives their iniquity and their trespasses. And we see that grace is demonstrated to God's forgives his people over and over and over again. And you think that after the first few verses here, uh, that they would learn their lesson against complaining and arguing with the Lord as he pours his judgment upon them. But no, they complain again after God's fire burns on them and some of them are destroyed. They cry out to Moses and he prays God and he quenches the fire. And it reminds me again, God is long-suffering towards us. There is a great quality of God in his patience that he is long-suffering. Um, there are times in our life where our patience runs thin or our patience runs out and uh, we have no more patience left to give. And those are those moments where we say, Lord, we should be saying, Lord, I need you. I need you to fill me with your spirit. Give me your patience because I don't have any of my own in this situation. And if we're humble and we pray, God will give us that patience we need to get through that circumstance. But what we see here is that God is long-suffering towards us. Again, he's not willing any perish, but that all should come to repentance, that all should come to put their trust in him. And then we also see here there was this mixed multitude that came with the children of Israel out of Egypt. It says they began to desire after their old life. And so this mixed multitude were not really full covenant people of God. They didn't have this total commitment to the Lord. They were coming along for the ride. And I would, I would imagine that after seeing the first nine judgments, those plagues in Egypt, they began to realize, like, okay, maybe we should listen to these Israelites a little bit more. And I'm sure there were those that did uh, obey in the 10th plague and apply some blood to their homes just to see what's the worst that could happen. And so we see there was this mixed multitude that then left Egypt and uh, went with the Israelites out of uh, the land of bondage. But then they begin to remember Egypt. Oh, we had so much fish in Egypt. Oh, those cucumbers, those melons, those leeks, those onions. Oh, and the garlic. They begin to, to long for the things of Egypt. The appetite of Egypt was still in their heart. Now, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Egypt is a picture of the world, the worldly things that draw us away from the Lord. The life of the flesh, which always leads to bondage and sin. And so the people were getting uh, tired of the bland diet of manna, and they began to desire for the things of Egypt, and the appetite of Egypt was still in their heart. And they forget the horrors of slavery in Egypt. They only remember the excitement of their flesh being satisfied. The fish, the melons, the cucumbers, that taste. And it reminds me that oftentimes we see things advertised on TV, whether it's alcoholic drinks or other things, and they forget to show you the aftermath, right? The, what happens the next morning and the person then being late to work or uh, the consequences from their actions and they don't want to show you that part, right? And the Bible tells us that sin is pleasurable, but it's pleasurable for a very short season and there's consequences that come after. And so it reminds me that there are some people today who have come to Christ, but they still have this kind of lukewarm relationship with him which is the same as this mixed multitude for lukewarmness is the mixture of the hot and the cold and Jesus would rather us be one or the other instead of be in that lukewarm state. Pastor Chuck Smith said there are those who after they come to Christ have tasted the world in their mouth and they long for the things of the flesh. They have not yet denied themselves taking up their cross to follow Jesus and they're now seeking to follow Jesus yet apart from the cross apart from self-denial, and thus apart from Jesus himself. And so we want to make sure that we have a desire for the Lord. And I believe a true follower will have so much of Jesus in their life, they can't truly be satisfied by the things of the world. There's not an, an attraction towards the things of the world anymore to, to fulfill the, the lust of the flesh. 
And yet there are those who are, I would say, a fake follower. They have so much of the world in their life, they can't truly be satisfied in Jesus. They've filled their heart with all the things of the world. There's really no more room for Jesus. And sometimes they'll try and add him on. Like, well, I want, I want a great life of health, wealth, and prosperity, so I'll add Jesus, but I'm not going to do anything else that he wants me to do. And so we see this this uh, a mixed multitude in the American church today with a, a nominal commitment, maybe a surface level commitment. Right? They'll say that they want to follow Jesus, but then their life doesn't really show that uh, they really want to follow him. And yet within their hearts, there's a taste, a desire for more of the world than there is a desire for more of Jesus. But a true follower of Jesus, there must be a total and complete commitment of your life to Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus said, you must be born again. Didn't suggest, hey, it might be a good idea if you become born again. No, he said, you must be born again. That is, we need uh, a spiritual birth. We need a new heart with new desires that long for the things of God. And that can happen if we surrender our life to God, put our faith and our trust what Christ has done for us, that he died on the cross for our sins, was buried because our sins killed him, and then he rose from the dead. He defeated death and the grave, the penalty that we deserve. He overcame and can forgive us and give us everlasting life. So we see that these, these lukewarm people are no longer satisfied with just the word of God or with Jesus, the spiritual bread that came from heaven. They now want more entertainment within the church. And what a tragic thing that is that churches today are doing to entertain people, appealing to their flesh, really, the things that God hates, right? That we're, we're trying to satisfy the flesh. And so we see that this is taking place in the camp, essentially. And imagine you're, you're Moses and you're walking among the people and you start to hear the people cry and you're kind of wondering, what's going on? Why are the people crying? And you hear them saying, Moses, give us meat to eat. We want meat. And Moses hears it and says, well, how am I going to feed all these people? There's no way that I can do that. And so he begins to just say, man, these people are ridiculous, the things they're asking of me. And, and Moses is essentially saying, I can't take it. I can't stand these people anymore. They're not my kids, God. They're your kids. This burden is too heavy for me. I can't bear this alone. I've had it with them. And so we see now that, that God sees this, that that complaining is kind of rubbing off on Moses. And, and God knew that both Moses and the people needed to be set free from their burdens. And that's what we'll see next, that God has a solution uh, to put uh, his spirit upon uh, the leaders of Israel to help with that burden. And he wants them to have this oneness in him. And so we'll see that next here in verse 16. And then we'll go all the way through uh, verse 30. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and, and bring them to the tabernacle of meeting, that they may stand there with you. That I will come down and talk with you there. I will take of the spirit that is upon you, and I'll put the same spirit upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, that you may not bear it yourself alone. Then you shall say to the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, for you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. Verse 19. You shall eat not one day, not two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you because you've despised the Lord who is among you. And you've wept before him, saying, Why did we ever come up out of Egypt? And Moses said, 
that people whom I am among are 600,000 men on foot. You have said, I will give them meat that they may eat for a whole month. Shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to provide enough for them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to provide enough for them? And the Lord said to Moses in verse 23, Has the Lord's arm been shortened? Now you shall see whether what I say will happen to you or not. Verse 24, So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tabernacle. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took of the spirit that was upon him and placed the same upon the 70 elders. And it happened when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, although they never did so again. But two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad and the name of the other was Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those listed, but who had not gone out to the tabernacle. Yet they prophesied in the camp. Verse 27. And a young man uh, ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesied in the camp. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, one of his choice men, answered and said, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. Then Moses said to him, Are you zealous for my sake? Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets, and the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And Moses returned to camp, he and the elders of Israel. We'll pause there. Well, we see that God tells Moses that he's going to take the same spirit that's upon him and put that spirit upon 70 of the elders. And Moses begins to hear this, that God's going to provide meat for the people. And he's trying to figure this out and, and, and saying, Lord, how in the world are we going to give that much meat to all the people to eat? And, and he's kind of saying, why should I tell him this, Lord? I, I don't understand how in the world you're going to do it. And so God essentially asked Moses, is the Lord's arm short on power? This is repeated in the New Testament in this way. Is there anything too hard for the Lord to do? No, there isn't. God can do anything, right? God can do a lot of different miracles. And so we see here that Moses uh, has seen the burning bush. He's seen the ten plagues, the Red Sea crossing, the manna, and even more. And I believe if we believe Genesis 1.1... In the beginning, God created. If we truly believe that, there's nothing hard for God to do. God can create bread that comes from heaven to feed us. God can give us meat if that's his desire. And we see that in the New Testament, Jesus feeds the 4,000 and the 5,000. Right? There's nothing hard for God to do to take care of his children. And so it's, it's interesting, I, as I was thinking about this, how we wrestle with this, that we limit God with our understanding. Well, God, there's no way on human earth that we can do this. So therefore, it must be impossible for you to do this. And yet, that's really what a miracle is. There's no scientific explanation for how it can be accomplished. But God can perform miracles. And he, he can do that whenever he chooses to do that. Isaiah 55, 9 says of God, My ways are not your ways, says the Lord. My ways are beyond your finding out. It's a good reminder that God is a lot smarter than we are. He is significantly more and more intelligent, way beyond we will ever have the intelligence of. His ways are way beyond our ways. And so we need to recognize that that God is in control and we can trust what he is doing. And again, if we can trust that in the beginning God created, surely we, we can believe God performing miracles. And again, we see Jesus doing many miracles. But yet for still, for some of people, that wasn't enough. And so we see the Spirit of the Lord comes upon these 70 men. They begin to prophesy. 
That is the begin to speak forth the word of the Lord. There is an aspect of prophecy that is predictive, but that's not always the case. Most of the time, it's just saying, thus says the Lord. It's saying forth the word of the Lord. And so we see even in the New Testament, this gift of prophecy, there is some predictive aspect, like Agabus, when Paul's on his way to Rome, grabs his belt and, and ties his hands and says, so is the man who owns this. This is what awaits you in Rome, and that's exactly what would happen. But much of the time, this gift in the New Testament is, is saying this is what the word of the Lord says, based upon his written word, based upon the scriptures. And so we see that um, it's just speaking forth the word of the Lord of the church is this gift for edification, for comfort, for exhortation. We also see that there were two elders who didn't come into the tabernacle to be a part of this uh, initial experience. They were, it says they were still outside the camp. But the Spirit of God came to them to rest upon them, and they began to prophesy. And then we see Joshua hears it, essentially says to Moses, hey, they're not in the tabernacle like us. Tell them to stop, right? And it reminds me in the New Testament, the disciples begin to hear that there's other people who are doing things in the name of the Lord, and, and they want the Lord to tell them to stop. And Jesus says, if they're not against us, they're with us. Again, this, this fleshly desire of competition, it, it comes so natural to us. And again, this is one of the reasons why we have a community worship service, that we, we partner with like-minded churches. We're putting up points on the same scoreboard. We're working together towards getting lost people into heaven connecting people with Jesus Christ. We may do that differently. We may make disciples differently. We may teach God's word differently. But at the end of the day, I believe there are going to be those in our community that we're going to be with them in heaven, and we should be getting along with them now and working together towards fulfilling what God has called us to do. When we see Moses is, in essence, uh, telling um, Joshua and the others his desire that, oh, the Lord will put his spirit upon all the people. See, Moses is beginning to realize this, that the answer to ease his burden was that God would take the same spirit upon him and put that spirit on others. And his hope was that God's spirit would fall on the entire camp of Israel to make his job easier, especially if they're all walking in the spirit. Pastor Chuck Smith said, The prophets did foresee this day. In Joel 2.28 it says, It shall come to pass, says the Lord, In the last days I will pour my spirit upon all the flesh. And so in the Old Testament, in certain times, in certain men, they had the anointing or the spirit upon their lives. But the camp of Israel was limited to these 70 men. So we see this picture of God's spirit working in the Old Testament. But if you've read the New Testament, Acts chapter 2, you know this day called the day of Pentecost where God's Spirit then becomes to, uh, upon the early church, descends upon them and empower them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter said in Acts chapter 2, verse 16 and 18, this is that which was spoken of the prophet Joel when he said, in the last day, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall see dreams. On my servants and maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in that day, says the Lord. So God's spirit can now dwell uh, within us and upon us. And uh, the church can be this glorious uh, picture of what God desires when we're walking in the spirit together. And I was thinking about that. How awesome would that be if we were all filled with the Spirit, we're all walking towards the Lord. All the problems at home would, would go away. All the problems and, and the work environment would go away. All the problems within the church and our community would go away if we were all seeking the Lord together. And that's what will happen when the Lord comes back and sets up his kingdom and we'll be with him forever in heaven as well. It'll be perfection. We'll have that unity that he desires of us. So we see that God's spirit can now dwell uh, within. And, uh, and it just reminds me as a dad that um, we can be setting that spiritual example at home. 
that we're being led by the Lord, that then we can lead our family in the direction of the Lord. And, and that's a picture of these, these spiritual elders of the camp of Israel, that they would then lead their families and the other um, families around them towards the things of the Lord, to be uh, the leader pointing people in the right direction. And so Moses, he foresees the advantage of the Spirit coming upon them. He did not forbid uh, this is a good thing, and it reminds me we all need to be filled with the Spirit of God if we're to walk in the ways of the Lord and, and have the Spirit of love at all times. And so there are three primary ways the Holy Spirit works. Uh, the first is what we find in Scripture is that He works outside of a person to draw them unto the Lord, to convince them they're a sinner, they're in need of Christ as a Savior, and then the second experience we see is the moment they put their faith and trust in what Christ has done for them, the Spirit then comes within them and seals them, um, and they are now a child of God. They're born again. And yet there's this third experience that we see in the book of Acts where the Spirit can come upon or feel a person, empowers a person, and, and it's always done for one purpose alone, and that's to be a witness unto Jesus Christ. Not to draw attention to ourselves, and if you've watched TV evangelists or those kind of things, you see a lot of that stuff uh, that they say the Spirit is there. It's drawing attention to the person instead of drawing attention unto the Lord. And we see all throughout the book of Acts, it's really, it's not the Acts of the Apostles, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit moving on the hearts of the people of God to go forth and love and share the good news with the people around them. And so this is that third experience, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the truth is we need to be filled, but then we need to be refilled every day, asking God, I need your help. I need you to fill me afresh today with your Spirit. Empower me uh, so that I can follow you with my whole heart. Help me, Lord, to represent you rightly to this lost and dying world around me. Help me to be your ambassador today. Help me to not complain and grumble. Help me to see interruptions in my schedule today as an opportunity, a divine appointment to point someone to you, to minister on your behalf to those around me. And so we need uh, the Lord daily, and uh, it just reminds me we're so prone to do things in our own strength or our, our own intelligence, and yet God has provision for us. And God's provision is not limited. In fact, we see him even reminding the people of that, Oh, you're not going to have just meat for one day or two days or five days or 10 days or 20 days. You're going to have it for a whole month. And yet we can sometimes limit what the Lord can do. And we need to be reminded that if the Lord is with us, uh, no one can come against us, right? God is, God is for us and he's got good things in store for us. And so that we can trust him. Again, his provision for us is not limited. And so we'll see that next here. In verse 31 through verse 35, as the Lord sends meat, he sends quail. So it says here in Numbers 11, verse 31, Now wind went out from the, the Lord, um, and it brought quail from the sea and left them fluttering near the camp. About a day's journey on this side, and about a day's journey on the other side, all around the camp. And about two cubits above the surface of the ground. And the people stayed up all that day, all night, and all the next day, and gathered the quail. He who gathered the least gathered ten homers, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. Verse 33. But while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was aroused against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a very great plague. So I called the name of that place Kirbroth Havatoth, because there they buried the people who had yielded to craving. From Kirbroth Havatoth to uh, the people moved to Hazaroth and camped at Hazaroth. We see here in this last section, this wind came forth, it started bringing the quail about two cubits. Uh, that could be a range probably about two and a half to three feet high off the ground. Um, and uh, it says that 
he will gather, gather least, gather 10 homers. So if we're going to use a baseball analogy, since we're talking about homers, I know that's a measurement, but go with me here. Uh, that would be about your striking range if you had a baseball bat, right? Um, and so they, hate, they had homers. So this is kind of a baseball uh, picture here, if you will. But we do see that, that God provided for them. They began to knock these quail out of the air one after another, one after another. And they were just flying in. And all this is all day long, all night long, all the next day. They're batting these quail out of the air and, and are able to then gather the meat. Again, as I said, God's provision for us is not limited. We often put God in a box and limit him. What we need to do is put our flesh in a box and limit our flesh. And, and let God do the work that only he can do. And so we see they, they gathered all this meat. One of the commentaries I read said it was about 850 gallons of quail that they gathered. And I'm sure after cooking it, uh, they would then kind of have this barbecue and eating together all the meat that they could desire. Um, and so they ate as much as they could. But there were the mixed multitudes still among them. And we see they still didn't trust the Lord. And so it's, they were judged. They perished. Uh, at this place at Kirbroth Havatavath, which means the graves of gluttony. What a, what a sooty name, this, this grave for the lust of more, a grave for selfishness, if you will. And I was thinking about that. I thought, if we're honest, how many people have been buried at this grave, a lust for more of the things of the world? Jesus gave this illustration about the parable of the soils, that his seed would go forth and, and be in, in, in a soil where it would be hard and, and the enemy would come and snatch away the, the seed that was sown. And, and then he gave this picture of this hard, rocky ground and, and, and it couldn't grow. And then one that was upon the thorns and the thistles and the cares and the worries of this life choked it off. And then finally the one that was on good ground that grew and produced. It reminds me that there are those that are going to say, I'm a follower of Christ, but then they don't continue in the way of Christ. The desires for the things of this world begin to choke out the desire for the Lord. And so it reminds me that uh, this is what Paul was referring to in 1 Corinthians 10. He said, these things all happen to them as examples unto us that we would learn not to lust after evil things after the old life, after the things of Egypt that bring bondage and sin. So we see that God provides for his people. I believe today that God provides for us. Where God guides, he will provide. We should be content with what he's given unto us and trust that he uh, is good and he is our, our good heavenly father. So in closing, God wants us to have this total commitment to him. And if you're here today, you're in this mixed multitude group, you can be completely set free by the Lord today. The burdens that you're holding on to, trying to do on your own strength, you can be set free from those. You can let those go and let the Lord be the Lord of your life, the master of your life. You can give him complete control of your life and simply follow him. Jesus said that, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. And then we can be filled with the Spirit. Again, complaining comes so naturally to us. But with God's help, we can do all things without complaining or murmuring. We can live without questioning the providence of the sovereignty of God. So my hope is that we would be ever grateful and ever thankful people unto the Lord. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the reminder here, Lord, in this chapter of the book of Numbers, that if we truly want to go back to the old life, to think it was somehow better than what we have now, Lord, uh, it's deception. It's a lie from the enemy. Help us, Lord, to realize that the life that we have in you is so much far better than anything else. Where would we go? You have the words of everlasting life. And we've come to believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one, the one who can set us free. 
and draw us unto himself. God, we pray that you'd help us to be people who aren't complainers, but people who are thankful, people who are generous and people who are grateful. And God, we do pray if there would be those here this morning who have yet to surrender their life to you. We pray that today would be the day of salvation. And if you're here this morning or watching online with a live stream or listening to this later on, and you'd say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me. I need to become born again. I need to get right with God. My sin is hindering that closeness with him. And if that's you this morning and you're ready to make that decision, to put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, I want to lead you in a prayer where you make that decision to surrender your life to the God who loves you, who made you, and knows you. If you're ready to do that, I just want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and mean it in your heart. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I realize that my sin separates me from you. And Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, that you were buried and rose from the grave. God, I ask that you'd forgive me of my sins that you'd come into my heart and my life today, that you'd be my Savior and my Lord, my Redeemer and friend. God, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you for adopting me into your family. I pray you'd help me to follow you with my whole heart from this day forward. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look, if that was you and that was the first time you prayed to receive Jesus or perhaps rededication, let me know. I'd love to encourage you, pray with you, give you a Bible if you don't have one. You've been listening to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Multher of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today as we study God's Word cover to cover. Verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Would you like to partner with us? Consider becoming a giver with us to support this ministry. Please visit ccfergusfalls.com slash giving. Find out more about this ministry and all of our ministries. Check out ccfergusfalls.com. May God bless you as you study his word with us and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. life to you I can shout from the inside